Well, greetings, folks. I was here about 10 or 11 years ago. I'm glad to see the tribe is healthy and, and vibrant. And this is really wonderful to see so many younger people here uh, picking up the torch and carrying it forward. Um, but this talk is something, I, I hope this talk will forever change your lives for the better. Um, this talk, I have to set the groundwork and the framework of a series of events that have occurred in my life. And these events, when you string them together, it comes to a paradigm shifting discovery that I truly think is revolutionary. And these ideas are much bigger than the messenger that presents them. I believe in, in that nature is intelligent. I believe in that we are only witnessing and discovering things that nature has already invented. But we are truly Neanderthals with nuclear weapons stumbling around this planet so cockeyed and full of hubris and so attached to our little computer devices that I think it's really important in this group here represents the body intellect of, of the earthlings that are connected to nature, that are connected to the soil, that has a much better sense. And so as a scientist, we are really trying to put metrics, intellectual metrics, creating language and words to be able to communicate ideas. But nature doesn't need to have our language. Nature has its own language. And so what I'm going to describe to you today is sort of a lifelong story that has that I am privileged to be in this body at this time. And I also want to dedicate this talk to my good friends Toby Hemingway and Dehinda. Um, there are two great brothers who have passed on. And um, I think a lot of us here were greatly influenced and touched uh, by their kindness and their mentorship. So, this is a night, this is a, I, a, an artist friend of ours uh, made this painting for me. And uh, this is really des describes towards the end of my talk is the is the connection between mushrooms and bees. Now I like this this painting a lot because these are actually all taxonomically correct. And being a mycologist it's really important that we don't have smurf mushrooms, you know, <laughs> up, up on the screen. Um, so I'm going to rock and roll. I will have to go through this fairly quickly because it's important that I get to the end. And I only have an hour and 15 minutes to, to do an hour and 45 minute talk. So here's a recent article that came out uh, in science. And unfortunately, over 58% of the ecosystems on this planet now have fallen below the threshold of species diversity that can um, maintain those ecosystems and the residents they're in, which means external inputs need to be brought in order to sustain the life systems um, of the populations. You know, we have entered into 6X, the sixth greatest extinction event known in the history of life on this planet. But this extinction event is not caused by an asteroid impact. It's caused by an organism, by us. We're not only the cause of this extinction event, but we're likely to be one of its victims. So it's an all hands on deck moment, folks. And we need to have actionable, ecologically rational, and scalable solutions. This is really important. We can't remain philosophers and idealists. We have to have boots on the ground. We have to be able to put into place remedies and solutions that are sustainable that will have a dramatically positive impact. And investing in biodiversity, I think, is absolutely key to this. So this is a representation. This is the actual uh, uh, pictograph from northern Algeria, then re-represented here, of the bee man. Uh, it's a bee shaman figure from 5000 BCE, about 7000 years ago. Um, and it's very interesting because the artist was clearly trying to communicate that the artist is pretty excited about mushrooms, don't you think? <laughs> Um, but amazingly, in four peer-reviewed articles, the authors dared not uh, suggest what, the, these, uh, the, what these mushroom-like uh, shapes were. 
is a, represent, a representation of mycophobia, the irrational fear of fungi. Even in academia, when you mention mushrooms, lots of people make a bad joke about being in the dark, being fed, you know what. Um, and so that sort of hindrance of not, not of scientists being reluctant to talk about something that is verboten in academia was really uh, my opportunity, because I've always been attracted to that which has been forbidden. And so when I was told that mushrooms were scary and dangerous and could hurt my twin brother when I pelted him with puffballs, uh, when I was five years old, I said to myself, thank you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, but, so, but this is unfortunate because it also has permeated into academia. Interestingly, mushrooms were very much used in beers, in fermented honey as well as, as beer, but the Beer Purity Act in Bavaria in 1516 specifically banned mushrooms. This, I think, is a struggle between monotheism and polytheism. The Germanic uh, tribal people were celebrating in the forests. And monotheism with the Christianity came in with the church and said you had to go to the church in order to see God. And I think there, that is representation of that division in philosophies. But going back, uh, this is 400 years uh, BCE. Um, this is a, 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 a codolith uh, showing uh, uh, Demeter giving Persephone a mushroom. And upon ingesting the mushroom, Persephone goes into a deep sleep. In Greek mythology, this is the onset of winter. And then upon the spring, she comes from the underworld, from Hades. She comes onto the, on, onto the landscape again, and that is the return of the longer days, sunshine, and the rebirth of plants. So interestingly, the way that Demeter is presenting this mushroom, for those of you who've ingested psilocybin mushrooms, this is the sort of right of passage and respect. When you present a psilocybin magic mushroom to a person, it's take this. This is special. You know, this is not like a porcini where you put it on the table. This is like, this is really special. So, <laughs> so um, 450 BCE, approximately, uh, Hippocrates uh, was using uh, Amadou mushrooms uh, for cauterizing wounds, and Dioscorides mentioned Agaricon. Now, Amadou is actually what this hat is made from. This is a birch polypore. It's a very hard mushroom, and this mushroom, when you put it into water, lye water, it delaminates into a fabric called mycelium. You'll see lots of mycelium. So this mushroom and lye water becomes a fabric, and some ladies in Transylvania are still making these hats. Now, there's only five hat makers currently. There used to be 20. It's a thread of knowledge that goes back thousands of years that fortunately has not broken, but how many threads of knowledge from our ancestors have been broken because of disease, war, famine, uh, poverty, accidents, whatever. But this mushroom is known as a fire starter mushroom. It enables you to carry fire for days. And moreover, you can hollow this mushroom in the inside, put embers of a fire, and then rekindle it. There's no doubt that we all came from Africa. We had two migrations, in Neanderthals and then Homo sapiens. About 40,000 to 80,000 years ago, there was an amazing uh, enlargement of our prefrontal frontal cortex. This goes, speaks to a different lecture that I, I'm giving elsewhere on microdosing and the evolution of consciousness using psilocybin mushrooms. But the Amadou mushroom allowed not only the portability of fire, but it revolutionized warfare. Because this was the punk that started, that would make flint uh, spark rifles ignite the gunpowder. Um, moreover, interestingly, this was used by beekeepers to smoke hives. Amadou also is the first mushroom ever to be found to have an antiviral uh, effect against the tobacco mosaic virus. So very interesting, and I think that Mushrooms, plants, animals become shamanistically important with indigenous peoples because of a multiplicity of benefits. And indeed, I think this is one example of that. So um, Amadou, because of its flammability, was used for cauterizing wounds. And another mushroom you'll be hearing a lot about is called agaricon, that Dioscorides first to treat, uh, described as a treatment against consumption, later thought to be known as tuberculosis. So uh, I'd like to give credit to my 
to my teachers. This is uh, Dr. Michael Bugue from the Evergreen State College, Alexander Smith from the University of Michigan, uh, Dr. Daniel Stuntz, University of Washington, and Kit Skase from, Cath uh, from um, Post Falls, Idaho. These three individuals were adopted me sort of as their mascot when I was about 18 years of age. Um, they've all passed on now, except for Michael Bugue. It's all the more interesting they uh, took me under their wing because these are basically politically conservative individuals, very much concerned about the interest in surge interest in magic mushrooms. But all the more interesting they took me under their wing because when I was 19, this is what I looked like. <laughs> <laughs> Your suspicions are now confirmed. <laughs> okay, so I, the old growth forest is where I spend a, a, a lot of time. For three years, I set chokers in the woods. I cut down the old growth forest. I'm a, a strong believer in the school of hard knocks. And I also walk in academia. So, but going and repaying the old growth forest is something that's really important uh, to me. So on, on Sundays, this is where my wife and I go to church. But let's look at a cross section of an ecosystem. You have saprophytic fungi that are breaking down wood. You have endophytic fungi that are growing inside of trees, literally, and plants. Literally hundreds of species of endophytic fungi now have been found to be part of plants that are their host defensive resistance against pathogens. You have mycorrhizal fungi, most of you know about that, that expands the, the rhizome and the rhizosphere enormously by many orders of magnitude, helping the absorption of, of uh, minerals and nutrients. The parasitic fungi, which are like the wolves, you know, calling the genome and, uh, and actually helping as, as, uh, screen out the weaker individuals and helping to fortify the, the genome of the, the survivors. So, but it is now known that all plants are part fungus. These are giant consortia, giant guilds. And um, it was thought for a long time that when you do thin sections under the microscope, that when you find, saw these fine filaments growing in association with plants, that they were infections. But now we know that the majority of these actually are endophytic fungi that are helping the plants survive. So this is important, especially for botanical medicine. You do an extract of a plant. What's the benefit from the fungal endophytes that are in the plant versus the plant themselves? Can you actually have a plant without endophytic fungi? present. You can under sterile culture, but you'd have a lot of effort in order to produce a fungus-free clone in vitro. So the way of nature is a plurality of these fungi, consortia, that are working together in concert. Excellent book is Mycorrhizal Symbiosis. This shows you the expansion. The majority of all this is mycelium. And an excellent article came out two years ago. It's a very simple experiment, and I'll quickly describe it. There's five bean plants. They're in separate pots. They expose the first bean plant to aphids, and that bean plant upregulated alkaloids that were, had anti aphid properties, part of its defense system. The four other plants, remote from contact, did not. They repeated the experiments and they put all the bean plants in the same soil so the roots would interconnect and the fungal networks would also interconnect. When they introduced the aphids to the first plant, what happened? All the other four plants, remote from contact, upregulated the same alkaloids that were anti-aphid. This showed definitively that there's a communication system underground that is where the community of, of plants are benefiting from the fungal networks that are alerting them to a pathogen or a parasite on the near event horizon. So this is how quickly the mycelium grows. That was uh, 10 days in a petri dish. And the mycelium is beautifully organized and has many different forms. But many people don't realize that fungi eat rocks. The mycelium consumes rocks, takes the minerals, and then channels them to plants. And so I would see these rocks in the forest, and I thought, oh, that's interesting, there's moisture down there, that the contact. No, that's actually a lens of mycelium that's consuming these rocks. So fungi were the first organisms to come to land over different estimates, 600 million years ago, 1.2 billion years ago. Plants soon followed. Plants and, and fungi allowed to, uh, lied together to form lichens. And so in the mycorrhizal fungi soon enabled lands to mar uh, land, uh, plants to march across the, the landscape. So we take wood chips, we add mycelium, lots of things happen, but ultimately we generate soil. Fungi, the grand molecular disassemblers of nature, the soil magicians. And worms specifically chase mycelium. 
So myceliated habitats in vermiculture, worms specifically choose myceliated, myceliated substrates over those that are not. I like to show this one because it shows the output from mycelium as it breaks down uh, wood or straw or any other type of plant material. What people are quite surprised and don't know that 100 kilos of dried sawdust will give you 20 kilos of water. The mycelium inhales oxygen, exhales carbon dioxide, breaks down plant material, combines hydrogen with oxygen, forming H2O. The mycelium produces enormous amounts of water. That's why there's sweat piles, uh, puddles around compost, pile, uh, compost uh, piles. And so in doing so, it hydrates its, its habitat in advance of contact. So this is a really important uh, article that came out on the unfortunate pra uh, logging practices that's pushing uh, monoculture and destroying the, the microsphere, destroying the resident saprophytic fungi, because you don't have a variegated canopies. You end up with similar aged trees, for instance, and so you don't have the cycling of fungi that you would normally have. What is really interesting to me is uh, that 70% uh, of soils are composed of microbes, but 30% of the soil mass is fungal. So that's an extraordinary amount of fungi that many of you know from no-till how important these fungal networks are. The mycelium, some of my electron micrographs, in response to four primary environmental stimuli, introduction of water, causes evaporation, drop in temperatures, number two. As the mycelium comes up to the surface because it's moisture, it exhales carbon dioxide, inhales oxygen, that's number three. And surprisingly, the fourth one is light. 99% of all mushroom forming fungi require light. If they don't have light, the mushrooms will not form. Even though they have no chlorophyll, uh, they are extremely phototropic and photosensitive. So upon that, then the primordia begin to form, and they quickly enlarge to a mushroom within a matter of three to four, five days. Now, why are mushrooms so feared? Why are they so misconstrued? Why are they so underappreciated? Well, I think for a lot of different reasons. In our viewscape, as we walk through life, we have daily, weekly, monthly, yearly encounters with plants and animals. We have a familiarity factor because we become acquainted with them. But something that is so potent that can kill you, that can feed you, that can send you on a spiritual journey, and is only up and gone in four or five days, is very ephemeral, very temporary. And so it's natural for humans to avoid that which they understand that is so potent. This is why I think the field of mycology has lagged behind some of the other sciences and not being fully appreciated. I'm fascinated by how mushrooms rot. Here's a mushroom uh, rushula in the old growth forest in a meadow. And a few days later, lots of sporulation is occurring. Spores are germinating. <coughs> and then a few days later, the mycelium goes subterranean, goes underground. The mycelium, as it grows underground, is, has bundles of nuclei, sometimes hundreds of nuclei per cell, streaming through the mycelial networks. This is a movie by my friend Patrick Hickey. And before he made this, we didn't know that these, these, these big clusters of nuclei would travel in concert. Now, if you look very closely, they don't all go in the same direction. A few of them go in the, in the other direction. So in a swath of mycelium, the breadth of my hands, my arms here, you can have hundreds of millions of end branchings. Now, the internal part of the mycelium is only two nuclei per cell, typically. But at the tips, there can be hundreds. Think of them as little scientists. And at the tips, they're encountering new potential food sources, new toxins, new food, new plants, whatever. If there is a recombination of genetic material that expresses a new enzyme that successfully captures that food and breaks it down, what happens? The mother mycelium becomes educated. So these are not only externalized lungs, externalized digestive membranes, but they also have the ability to learn at exceptional paces. So I live in Washington State, in the southern region of the Puget Sound. Here's the Columbia River. We're going to do a fly down here to the largest organism in the world, is a mycelial mat, 1,665 football fields, 2,200 acres in size. And think of it, and it's one cell wall thick. Right on the other side of that cell wall are hundreds of millions of microbes, many of which want to consume the mycelium. How is it that 
a membrane one cell wall thick and direct contact with hundreds of millions of other uh, uh, microbes per gram can achieve the largest mass of any organism in the world. It's because of epigenesis and the fact that these are in constant biomolecular communication with this ecosystem, learning strategies to be able to uh, survive, and also predetermining the ecosystems that give rise to the plants that give rise to the canopies that create the debris fields that feed the mycelium. These are mothering membranes whose interest is in the long-term survival of the ecosystems, not for its own individual survival, of course that comes with it, but in order to have a plurality and biodiversity in the ecosystem is absolutely critical for these fungal networks to be able to thrive. Whew, that was a tongue. <laughs> So in this case, it's the honey mushroom, Armillaria astoii. And I have to, I like to go back on this because I hired an airplane out of Boeing Field. I flew there twice and we couldn't find it. And we went back and we, in, the, in the scientific literature, there's a latitude and, and, and longitude reading. So we went back, we were right on top of it, but we weren't high enough. So we flew back again and I spiraled up, spiraled up, spiraled up in this airplane. We got up to about 15,000 feet. And I'm in a little tiny canvas covered airplane, literally, it's a bush pilot from Alaska. And I said to the pilot, I think I'm gonna faint. I mean, we just came from sea level to 15,000 feet you know, in an hour. And he goes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, I'm gonna get a photograph first. You know, but <laughs> so this is the, the best photograph of the largest organism in the world. Um, I beat National Geographic on this one. Anyhow, so. The mycelial network, you know, is designed uh, to resist from catastrophia. There's no cell place that you can break the mycelium that'll harm it. It's one of the few organisms in nature where you disturb it, it grows more vigorously. In fact, this is a technique by mushroom growers to scratch their beds to disturb the mycelium because you get another flush of mushrooms. So it's, um, these are, are, there's, we separated from fungi 650 million years ago. There's a new super kingdom, kingdom uh, called a Pisthaconta that joins animal, animalia and fungi together because we exhale carbon dioxide, we inhale oxygen. Many of our best antibiotics against bacteria come from fungi, but very few good antifungal antibiotics are out there because they tend to harm us because of our closer evolutionary relationship. So the mycelium also then is, can be parasitized by bacteria, but a minor population of bacteria out there are actually mutualistic, that the mycelium pre-selects in order to fortify its immunity against bacterial pathogens using the bacteria's defense mechanism against other bacteria. So the mycelium sets up guilds of microbes, microbiomes. And some of you were in my talk yesterday, I showed you next-gen sequencing, where there's a thousand-fold difference in the genera of bacterial populations between two different mushroom species grown on the very same material. So we do know they select out microbiomes that are favorable to the plant communities that give rise to the ecosystem that can feed the fungi. So the mycelium sweats these little droplets, lots of water, as I mentioned, but also in them is antibacterial, antiviral, messenger uh, compounds, uh, the whole slew of extremely interesting uh, constituents. There's over 240,000 novel molecules that comprise a mushroom, many of which are not found elsewhere in nature. The mycelium, when it grows, is tenacious. It prevents erosion. This rhizomorph here of mycelium, I cut off a centimeter, weighed it, and weighed this. There was a 30,000 to one difference in the mass, which means one centimeter held 30,000 times this mass. When I, I could have made this one millimeter, that would have been 300,000. So myceliated uh, substrates, as we know from no-till, prevents erosion. Those, those, those fungal networks you know, tend to retain uh, the soil and prevent uh, loss of nutrients. The quickly diverging rhizomorphic mycelium is, for me, as a cultivator, is what I relish to see, these rapidly forking rhizomorphs. This is where epigenesis is occurring. This is where polynucleation is occurring. Is, uh, is there, ex the vigor of growth is just extraordinary. So my wife, Dusty, and I spent a lot of time in the old growth forest. And in the old growth forest has been become a treasure trove of our genomic library. We have about 700 species and strains in our cultural library to date. Um, and we march these things out. Some of them we preserve just for posterity. We don't, there's not enough hours in the day to do what we need to do to explore the beneficial ecological and medicinal properties of these fungi. 
But I am really fascinated with decomposition. This is my manly man photograph. <laughs> I, when I was 19, 20 years old, I suffered from testosterone poisoning. A lot of you young men, and for that matter, women also. You know, you, you do dangerous things. So I, the most dangerous job in the world was being a logger setting chokers. So I go, well, that's for me. So, so I did that, and then three guys in my crew got killed. And they wanted to make, make me the, the hooker. That means the top dog on the crew. And I decided to go back to college. <laughs> so, I, um, so one mushroom resident in the old growth forest is called Agaricon. It is uh, Fomitopsis officinalis. It's the longest living mushroom in the world. It's a perennial polypore. The Amadou grow for three or four years. This grows for up to 100. These are annual growth rings. Um, and um, I was, was very interested, I have been, in the Garicon, I wrote several articles. And then the Nat Geo, National Geographic, gave me a Green Invader Award. And they were fascinated by my interest in a, this rare mushroom called a Garicon. Now, my dear professor, Michael Bug, who I showed a photograph of, he goes out in the old growth forest a dozen, 20 times a year. He found his first Garicon last year. That's how rare it is. And he's an expert. So finding a Garicon is not easy. When you do find it in a valley, oftentimes there are satellite colonies and other trees, as one would expect. So National Geographic wanted to do a story on me on a search for a Garicon so they could send a photojournalist out. And we decided, well, why don't we go up the inland passage of Desolation Sound in British Columbia? And they said, well, we don't want you to take us to a site where there's already an Agaricon. We want to, to find a new one. I don't know. Well, National Geographic, I'm like, great, they're coming out. Oh, bad news. They want to find a new Agaricon. They said, well, how likely will we find it? And I go, oh, 50-50, maybe. But I had, I, what I, the reason for that is we got a motor sailor, you know, uh, in a Zodiac. It went up the Desolation Sound. And these things look like giant beehives, and where bald eagles are in trees, oftentimes you find a garicon. So you look for a living snag, bald eagles. And so I took 10 of my friends, high power binoculars, and we scanned the horizon. Now, we left at like 7.30 in the morning. And by 11.30 at night, we're going up uh, in, in that morning, four hours later, we're going up Desolation Sound, and we have retina burn. Because look at a tree there, uh, nothing there, uh, tree there, uh, nothing there, uh, tree there, nothing there. You do that hundreds of times, and you're like, you know, dizzy. And so this, the photojournalist was getting pretty impatient. Paul, you promised me. And I said, I said 50-50, dude, you know. So, so we're going along, and so our skipper said, you know, this is not doing too well. It's lunchtime. Let's go over to our First Nations site where there's some interesting pictographs. We don't know what they mean, but let's go over there and have lunch. Now, this is a 30-foot overhang. You can bring canoes, you know, or a boat right up into this flat area. It's, you know, used to run red with salmon. The perfect place to get out of the weather and also be, have access to the water and fish. So we're motoring over there, and then Jimmy, one of our, our, our colleagues, goes, there's one. And sure enough, we found one. This is amazing because this agaricon was attached to an upper limb. It fell. It hit this limb. It teeter-tottered. Then it regrew its mycelium back into the tree, and then it grew two legs. So it was a really extraordinary agaricon. We got really excited about this, going, wow, this is great. So, you know, the photojournalist was really excited. So we're there. And um, there's an interesting legend with the Haida people and other first uh, Northwest coastal uh, first peoples um, about the origination myth of women. And with the Haida culture in particular, this is Raven, and she's traveling on a canoe in the Sea of Eternity. And no one can help Raven succeed in finding her genitalia. She is sex sexless at this point, except one person in the back of the canoe can help her and is known as Fungus Man. And it's either Agaricon or the Artist Con. There's two different competing uh, theories for this. But these are Agaricons that are carved and placed on gra as grave guardians upon shamans' graves to help them go into the afterlife. So Agaricon was not only revered by Dioscorides in Greek culture, but with the Haida and their first peoples will also realize that it was a very important medicinal ally, and spiritually so as well. <clears throat> so, Gu Zhao is the president of the Haida people. I felt it was my mission to bring back the knowledge of Agaricon back to the Haida. 
They, uh, there was two smallpox pandemics. Some people call it the first bioterrorist acts of the United States government against indigenous peoples, where they purposely gave smallpox infected blankets, and they didn't even have to fight these warriors. They could walk in the village the next day, in the next year, and they would be dying of smallpox. So Gujal, and this is the, this is, uh, the artist conch, is the other one that may have been this fungus creature in the back of the canoe, because the artist conch you can draw a map on, and it would make sense that, well, you're in a canoe, you need to find your genitalia, you need a map to it, so why not draw it on the artist conch? So we don't really know whether it's a Garakon or the artist conch, to be fair here, but there's two competing um, um, myths uh, or candidates for supporting uh, the origination myth of women in the Haida culture. So I'm Dr. Scott Franzblau, supported by the Gates Foundation, the director of Tuberculosis Research Institute, University of Chicago. Read one of my articles, got real excited, and said, Paul, I want to come with you. So this is actually one of the pictographs at that site. And, um, and there's two wide-eyed, and it's very similar. You know, it's made with salmon eggs, by the way, um, and painted, but it's faded a lot. So Scott was real excited and said, you know, I read about Dioscorides and Agaricon been used in treatment against consumption. Paul, we think consumption was tuberculosis. I'm a tuberculosis expert. I'm the head of this tuberculosis research laboratory. I want to travel with you. So Scott and I teamed up. Now, this is classic pharmaceutical discovery with natural products. You take a plant, you take a mushroom, and you, it's called bio-guided fractionation. And basically, you have a, a water, the most polar solvents, you use water, and then you use the least uh, a, a polar solvent, like hexane, and hexanes will pull out lipids, and water will pull out uh, proteins and polysaccharides. Well, you have two different solvent extractions, and now you test both of them, which one showed more activity against tuberculosis? It's a decision tree. Oh, this one over here did. And then you fractionate it again. And then you go, okay, which branch of that fractionation increased potency against tuberculosis? That's a classic way that drugs have been discovered from natural products. So we did this over four or five years, and sure enough, Scott, Dr. Scott Franzblau, uh, Guido Pauli, and myself and other colleagues, we found two uh, novel anti-tubercular compounds called chlorinated coumarins, highly active against uh, XDR-TP, multi-drug resistant strains of tuberculosis. So we published in the journal Natural Products. It was a classic you know, pharmaceutical discovery path. We got very excited about it, but we, in a sense, confirmed what our ancestors knew, that agaricon seemed to help against tuberculosis. Um, now, tuberculosis was not resident with the height of people in North Coast Indians, nor with flu viruses, nor with smallpox. So uh, Gujal's people, when he said, Paul, we, if we knew about agaricon, we would have used it, but you have to realize, in 40 years, we had four pandemics that killed 75 to 95 percent of the elders and the people in his tribe. So the thread of knowledge was cut you know, from their ancestors. So, okay, so this is great. We found two active molecules, active against tuberculosis from agaricon, supports the Haida use and the, the use by Dioscorides. And we're at this site, and I'm such an idiot, because I see this rock, but I'm there for hours, okay? And I look at, oh my, this rock is really interesting. Whoa. There's that rock. There's a Garricon, there's a rock, there's a Garricon, there's a rock, there's a Garricon, there's a rock. <laughs> this is how my brain works, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, we found a rock that looks like, it's shaped like a Garricon. Now how likely is it we'd find a Garricon? I don't know, one out of a hundred. How likely is it we'd find a Garricon at a First people site that seemed to be really important? Well, I don't know, one out of 10,000, one out of 100,000. How likely is we to find it where there's pictographs that look really reminiscent you know, of the Haida origination of the myth? I don't know, one in a million. How likely is we to find it where there's a rock that looked like it's been carved like an agaricon? I don't know, one in 10 million. How likely is it we to find it on my birthday? <laughs> And this is when the photojournalist started shaking and looking at me and turned to one of my friends and said, does this happen to Paul often? <laughs> and my friends looked at him deadpan and said, yes. <laughs> and this is something that as a scientist, and I believe there's a convergence. I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. There's a convergence of science and spirituality. I believe if you walk with respect for elders, respect for indigenous peoples, respect for the ecosystem, 
you walk in faith and with good intention, nature and science will reward you. I strongly believe that. So at Garicon, there's hard times, hard times to find. You know, this is uh, my friend Scott Baker, uh, Scott Baker. He is an arborist and tree climber, going up a 700-year-old Douglas fir tree on Cortez Island. This is one of the oldest agaricon we've ever seen at the time, the oldest one. And um, this is the new growth. This one's about 70 to 80 years of, of age. It does not rot the branch that supports it, very interestingly. Um, and so we went up and we were able to get cultures of it. Now here's the ghost form with Scott and Mel has a living form. And so there's a metamorphosis from the, uh, this form to this form. And the ghost form is what was considered to be extra extraordinarily important. It's dead. It takes four or five years or longer laying on the ground where it, metamorph it metamorphosizes biochemically into this quinine form. It's known as the quinine fungus. It doesn't have any quinine, but it's extremely bitter. So very interesting. So this is the largest one we've ever seen, the NorCal kind of guy, can you tell? <laughs> um, found it uh, east of uh, Sacramento on a large tree, an old growth large tree. That, and they were going to cut down the large trees. And this person called up because he'd seen my talks on Agaricon. So probably I found a huge one. You know, should I pick it? I go, oh, don't pick it. And let's GPS it. Let's leave it in the forest. We don't want to pick these things. And he goes, well, they're going to cut down the forest. And I go, oh, in that case, pick it. <laughs> so the logger's going to come through. They're going to destroy it. So, you know, sure. And so he sent us, a, I'll send you a small chunk. He sent us a chunk, about two pounds. So this one's about 100 years of age. We now have 77 strains of agaricon in our cultural library. By far the largest cultural library in the world um, and different ecosystems. But we typically just GPS them. We leave them uh, resident. We take a stainless steel tube, a small amount of tissue is taken out, and then we get it in the culture. And so my cultural library is probably my greatest personal material asset. If my family, my employees are taken care of, and there's an earthquake or a fire, it's my cultural library. Everything else can burn. Everything else can be destroyed. My genomic library cannot be replaced very easily, except for many lifetimes, and many of these ecosystems have already been decimated. So we've lost the genomic library of Agaricon within those ecosystems. So I wrote an article, and two articles in Herbalgram in June of 2001. And I did a synopsis by doing literature review of all the articles ever published on the antiviral properties of mushrooms and all the antibacterial properties of mushrooms. Two consecutive articles, a whopping one page long. That's all there was in the scientific literature. I was amazed. Penicillium molds, hundreds and hundreds of articles. And this is all the articles that were ever published on the antiviral and antibacterial properties of mushrooms. And half this page is photographs, right? So. So I was like, wow, that is bizarre because mushrooms like to resist, resist rot. Um, they want to sporulate. They're in contact with the microbes. How weird that scientists would avoid mushrooms for exploration of novel antimicrobials. Well, that was in June of 2001, and then 9-11 occurred. And a researcher, medical uh, a researcher, physician, uh, saw my articles and said, Paul, you should really get involved with the BioShield Biodefense Program. I'm going to get you invited. So um, I was invited, and we started preparing specimens, uh, mushrooms boiled in hot water, mycelio extracts prepared in different ways, the water and ethanol. And um, lo and behold, uh, I submitted, <laughs> there's so many stories I could tell you. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you one real quick. Um, I got these research results that came in. Federal Express from the BioShield from the Department of Defense. And a Federal Express package, I'm flipping through them, no activity. This is against smallpox, no activity, no activity, no activity. I get to sample 77 and it said high activity. Sample 79, high activity. Sample 85, high activity. I got really excited. I didn't tell them what the specimens were. They were coded with the laboratory codes. I looked them up and all those three hits were Agaricon. I went, wow, I got real excited, and I was given a, a colonel physician who was my point of contact, sole point of contact with the BioShield program. So I called him up and said, oh, this is great, we have great results, I can't believe it, 77, 78, 85, hugely active against smallpox. He goes, what results? 
I go, well, Federal Express just delivered them to me. He goes, you're not supposed to get those. I'm supposed to get those. I said, no problem. I'll photocopy and send them to you. <laughs> so, um, so this went on for a while. We had extraordinary results. Then there is a vetted press release from the Department of Defense. It says we have the best results of more than 200,000 specimens submitted. It's actually over 2 million. You can Google my name, Stamets and Smallpox and National Public Radio. You'll hear an interview with myself, the Deputy Director of the BioShield Biodefense Program and the Deputy Director of the FDA. And I was then blurted out. You know, that, you know, this means, at the, my TED talk, this means that we should save the old growth forest as a matter of national defense. And, whoa. I, I then, at that moment, learned the significance of sound bites, you know. And the Department of Defense, they loved this, you know. So I had, they had calls coming to me personally from other researchers saying, we are so excited about this. And sure enough, so we had very good results against uh, pox viruses, orthopoxes, vaccinia, um, uh, variola, which is smallpox. And um, those of you after 1962, I believe, are no longer vaccinated. So many of you before 1962, after the age of five years, you have a smallpox vaccination on your arm. The majority of you don't. You're what we call immunologically naive. If there's a smallpox pandemic, you are extremely susceptible to, to dying. But, but there's good news. So we started working with the University of Mississippi, the NCNPR, National Center for Natural Box Research. We did the same thing, bio-guided fractionation. Two solvents, we split. We did this five or six years. We found two novel anti-smallpox molecules inside of agaricon, more potent than sidofovir, which is the preeminent antiviral drug control. So agaricon is active not only against bacteria, tuberculosis, it's active against viruses, including smallpox. So it's a consortium of many active constituents. This is a real argument for natural medicine. So um, we identified these new molecules. It was, it, again, it took hundreds of thousands of dollars. So with both of these experiments, hundreds of thousands of dollars were expended in order to find these novel molecules resident and nationally produced within these fungi. Well, very quickly, the BioShield program became very concerned about weaponizable flu viruses. And so sure enough, they said, Paul, listen, we have your samples. We would love to test against flu viruses. Is it okay with you? I said, sure, go ahead. And then we hit another big home run. But to give you an idea, you know, two and a half percent of the population of the world died in 1918 from H1N1, it's a pig flu. Uh, the poultry flu virus, uh, H7N9, recently came through a few years ago. There is a H5N1 has a 60% mortality for those people who get infected. H5N1 is in about 10 locations right now in Asia, causing quarantines, you know, all over Asia. For preventing, because if it jumps with, combines with pig flu, H1N1, and H5N1 combined, then you have a highly contagious flu virus that will kill the majority of people that get it. And this last flu season, as many of you know, was, was pretty bad. Just imagine every 60% of those people that you know had flu would die. So then the uh, poultry virus uh, swept Minnesota and Iowa, H7 and, and, and 9. And a person who has a very large poultry business, I helped out their, his family with a personal medical issue. And he goes, Paul, listen, we're euthanizing millions and millions of chickens and turkeys. I says, you know, can you send us some of this agaricon? So we sent 50 kilos of agaricon to an organic chicken farmer in Iowa. And they consumed it in their feed. It's just mycelium grown on rice. And those 20,000 chickens never got the virus. It became an oasis of immunity. Now, there's an enormous, I mean, there's a millions and millions and millions of chickens and turkeys were euthanized. And so we had a, a sort of our first little uh, quasi-clinical study, uh, you know, with, with chickens. So uh, BioShield uh, is, uh, had is four different agencies that were involved, uh, including NIH, virology. And Dr. Earl, Earl Kern is a virologist, and I'm going to give you a metric here. It's a cellular activity index metric. Anything of two is over is active. Ten or active means you've got something really potent. That's where many of the antiviral medicines that people take have cellular activity indexes of 10 or more. 
So I just got this data last week, and it's so curious. They tested 2,392 samples from me. I had no idea it was that many. I just kept on sending them in. Um, <laughs> so I, I never thought I would speak these words, but I want to personally thank Dick Cheney and George W. Bush <laughs> for funding this research. Now, I say that a little flippantly, but actually it has a deeper meaning and consequence that I want to lead you to. So I am indebted to the U.S. Defense Department and NIH Virology and the BioShield Biodefense Program, which continued until around 2009. Um, and then one of the researchers, Craig Day, was so excited about our results that he continued the antiviral studies unbeknownst to us until last week, where he told us, you know, Paul, because all he had is the alphanumeric numbers. He goes, I, the samples were so potent. I, I, I was just curious. I wanted to do more tests with them. So we are continuing our, relation now, our relationship now with the Utah State Institute of Antiviral Research because we have some other extraordinary results against other viruses. So in, in summary, 2,392 samples. These are the best results. So that's a pretty big d uh, data set. Uh, so the ribavirin is a, I think over 10 is highly active, 3,270. Yeah, that's, that's positive drug control. And our extracts were in 35% ethanol. This is in vitro human cell assays. You can't put 35% ethanol in contact with living human cells. It'll kill them. So they diluted them 10 to 1, 3.5, 10 to 1 again, 100 to 1 dilution. So these are our results with 100 to 1 dilution of a natural mycelial extract in water and ethanol compared to a pure pharmaceutical drug control. Off the charts. 10 times more, oftentimes, than the positive drug control active against flu viruses, including Agaricon. Agaricon is active not only against smallpox, a DNA virus, but also against flu viruses, which are RNA viruses. From a vir virological point of view, this is kind of unprecedented, but it's because I think there's many other active molecules resident within these natural uh, wild mushrooms. So we were able to grow them up, and then a combination of three of them, uh, the selectivity index is 30 times more potent than ribavirin. So this was really exciting for us to get these research results, and then it began to dawn on me that I'm entering into a field of discovery much broader than anything historically ever anticipated, and especially by me. So uh, the first patent issued in 2014. In uh, 2014, this patent was submitted in 2004. It meandered and got uh, stopped in the patent office for 10 years. After three or four years, I got a hold of my patent exam uh, uh, lawyer. I said, where is my friggin' patent? You file a patent in two years, or a year is up on the patent application homepage. The Department of Defense hijacked my patent because of national security. Wow. It took it out of the patent office. We had to do an intergovernmental agency trace and pulled back the patent out of national security. They had to jury it and then think it was a big deal. So we got it back and a universality of opinion of 10 patent examiners approved the patent. Well, that was great. But then the Russians came out from the Vector Institute and they discovered the same thing I discovered, but eight, eight years later. Well, actually, that's good news because the Vector is like the Fort Detrick of Russia uh, where they have smallpox. And then another group of scientists also came out and affirmed what I had discovered eight years later. So that actually, that's good. That means other scientists are also validating what I discovered. Okay, so now we're going to get into a little bit of more of the science here. As it turns out, there was a shortage of Tamiflu. Many of you know about that. You know, uh, Rumsfeld has an has a equity interest you know, in the Tamiflu licensing. And huge amounts of Tamiflu were taken off the market. It comes from the star anise, which is grown primarily in Afghanistan and in the Middle East. And it's harvested once a year. You can imagine the supply chain is issues. Tamiflu's precursor is a star anise. As it turns out, oyster mushroom mycelium, when exposed to light, can produce the Tamiflu precursor 24-7 in vitro. Light stimulates an antiviral substance coming from mycelium. This was like, whoa, interesting. <clears throat> so the reishi mushroom, we grow lots of that. My friend, Dr. Andrew Weil. Uh, reishi has now been sequenced. And the interesting news about this is over 25% more genetic uh, gene expressions in the mycelium than in the mushrooms. The mushrooms are at the end of the life cycle. To get there was a struggle. 
over years, months, and then the mushrooms come up for a few days, disappear. So it's, it's, it's logical that the mycelium has a lot more uh, upregulation needs to defend itself against pathogens than the end of the life cycle. So we explored mushroom extracts versus the mycelial extracts. Hands down, the mycelial extracts turn out to be more, more potent. Okay, all this now leads up to the following story. I don't know how to tell the story except by calling them mycofactors. So all of that, believe it or not, was mycofactor one. I'm going to take you through a mycofactorial equation that ends with an epiphany that I think is truly paradigm shifting. So just clear your receptor sites now. All, all of that was just setting the stage of antibacterial, antiviral properties from these mushrooms. So here we go. I'm growing the garden giant mushroom. Many, several of you were in my workshop yesterday. It grows on the garden and on the ground, grows in wood chips. I go, I had two beehives. I go out to my raised beds where I have the garden giant and I look closely and I can't believe it. But there's bees going from my beehives to my garden giant patch, all sorts of flowering plants. There's a convoy of bees for 40 days in the summertime from dawn to dusk. And they went to my garden giant patch and they moved the wood chips and they were sipping on the mycelium, those little droplets. And I got really close to my camera and I took these photographs. It took me, you know, hours and hours in a 120 degree attic going through Kodachrome 64 slides to find these two slides. I finally found them. And so I published this in Harrowsmith Ma Magazine in 1988 in one of my books in 1999 and thereupon forgot it, okay? That was Michael Factor number two. So these are experiences in my life. When you string these together, it catalyzes towards a solution. So a beekeeper in Ontario wrote me, said, maybe that's why bees go to sawdust piles in the summertime. Nobody else mentioned it. I forgot about it. I, I spent a lot of time in the old growth forest, and I'm really fascinated by bears. Bears scratch trees. And when the bears scratch trees, resin comes out, and bees are attracted to the tree resins for propolis to patch their hives. Well, so that's interesting. I had noted that before. And I'm walking the South Fork of the Ho River with my wife, Dusty, when I like to orienteer. My employees call it the Stemetzian Death March. It's not really true. <laughs> But I, I don't call it getting lost. I call it being temporarily disoriented, you know? <laughs> so we're temporarily disoriented, bushwhacking in the old growth forest beyond the, the end of the trails. And we go around a corner and we see this bear strike. This is like a bear going, boom, ah, you know, one of the best bear strikes I've ever seen. So I thought, wow, this is interesting. This is kind of a teaching moment. So I said, you know, Dusty, this is really interesting because where we live in Kimilchi Point, Washington, they have killed hundreds and hundreds of bears. The, lumber, the timber industry was hired by the Forest Service to kill bears because they caused a polypore mushroom infection of the red belted polypore. So humans are so good doing exactly opposite their best interests. Now we know that bears bring salmon carcasses and sea salts and minerals from the ocean that helps the trees grow. But they killed all the bears in our area. But I thought, you know, that's interesting. Let's come back to this bear strike in two years and let's see what's growing there. Well, two years later, I mean, it took us about six to eight hours to find this. And there is the, the bear strike. There's a photograph that I had before. Bear scratches are entry runes for polypore mushrooms. And sure enough, they had that right. The red belted polypore, a sister species to agaricon, grew, was growing out of the bear scratch. So bear scratches do cause polypore mushrooms to grow. I went, wow, too bad they killed the bears, but academically, I mean, I could see where they were coming from. They wanted to protect the timber board feet of lumber by preventing the trees from getting a disease. Okay, mycofactor number three. Okay, all right, bear scratches provide entry wounds for polypore mushrooms. So my friend Louis Schwartzberg, who's a Nat Geo Walt Disney filmmaker, Say, Paul, you know, the bees are really in trouble. What can you do to help the bees overcome colony collapse disorder? And I said, huh, that's really weird because it rekindled this memory of me having my beehives going after my garden giant mycelium. And I said, Louis, let me think about that. 
So uh, uh, President Obama came out with a presidential memorandum. Bees are dying from a confluence of stressors, bee nutrition, forage lands, parasites, viruses, pesticides, neonicotinoids, glyphosates interfere with the microbiome of the bees. And so it's a perfect storm of stressors. The bees are the canary in the, in the, can, and, and, and the, and, and the coal mine, so to speak. Uh, Apis mellifera is a European honeybee. It's brought over in the 1700s, again in the 1800s. And 80% um, of our pollination benefits for farmers come from wild bees. 20% comes from cultivated bees, Apis mellifera. So the use of neonicotinoid and insecticides now shows a reduction in sperm quality, viability, reduces drone lifespan. Here is, uh, thanks to Whole Foods, here is your grocery selection in the dairy department. With the benefit of bees, this is, it would be without bees. 30% of your food is directly dependent upon bee pollination. 60% is indirectly dependent. So the, it's a worldwide threat to global food supply. This is one of the biggest problems that we face today. The entomologists that I'm working with have predicted that within 10 years, some say five, commercial pollinate, pollination is going to be over uh, for uh, uh, using bees for, for commercial pollination. So here is a, you know, this is going to be difficult, this is a three minute movie uh, that showed in hundreds of PBS stations. So I might have to go five minutes over. Just like wow, very nice. These girls are fantastic. I lift that lid up and those girls are solid across there and they're making honey and they're making babies. Eric Olson owns more colonies than any beekeeper in Washington state. Hot dog! There's nothing greater than to open a beehive and see them doing well. They're doing well today. Look at that! I'm really tickled with this. But just months ago he opened his hives and discovered nearly half his bees were dead. I spent 20 years as a pilot in the Air Force in my share of combat situations, and I never was as low as I was when all those bees were dead. That's the lowest time of my life. It turns out this may be the new normal. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says that nearly half of colonies across the country died in the 2014 season. Big losses have been happening for years, and scientists haven't pinpointed what's causing them. They say more than 60 factors may play a role in collapsing colonies. Factors like pesticides, malnutrition, and loss of habitat. If we don't find some answer, I am really concerned about whether these little girls will survive. But one unlikely solution may be growing close by, in the forests of western Washington. Oh, there's another one. Enter Paul Stamets. He's a pioneer in the study of mushrooms. This is a beautiful specimen. The white margin here means it's growing really well. What I call happy mushrooms. Makes me a happy person too. I'm involved in the study of fungi ever since a very young age. My initial interest was magic mushrooms and then I got into edible mushrooms and medicinal mushrooms and my mother was much happier. <laughs> Stamets scours the forest for rare types of fungi. I use mycology and the use of fungi to help clean up the environment, improve the immune system of animals, and I began to think. We've gone to the moon, we've gone to Mars, and we don't know the way of the bee. All right. You know, I bet you I can do something to help the bees. Stamets recently discovered a mushroom that might be able to take on one of the honeybee's worst enemies. And that's called the Varroa mite, with the, the name Varroa destructor. Varroa mites began wreaking havoc on U.S. beehives in 1996. We lost about half the colonies east of the Mississippi over that winter. Steve Shepard is an entomologist at Washington State University. He spent decades trying to understand how Varroa mites cripple honeybees. He says they invade hives and attach themselves to infant bees. I always think of it as having something about the size of a pancake feeding on you. They live off bee blood and transmit a slew of viruses to their hosts. Some sickly bees lose the ability to fly, 
and gather food for the hive. Many end up dying prematurely. They'll kill the colony within a couple of years unless beekeepers intervene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why Shepard decided to try a new approach. Uh, something doesn't look quite right with it. Yeah, it'll never fly. He teamed up with Paul Stamets. Stamets told him about a type of fungus that's highly attractive and highly lethal to termites. Shepard wondered what this termite-killing mushroom extract would do to the varroa mite. So we should uh, do something with this hive, yeah. huh? Ready? He recently started testing the product on bees in his lab. So we take bees from colonies with high mite levels. We set up numerous cages, some with fungus. They're finding that the product is killing mites without harming bees. It's certainly uh, encouraging so far. And that's not all that mushrooms can do for bees. Bees have immune systems, just like we do. And these mushrooms, they're like miniature pharmaceutical factories. Their initial results show that certain forest mushrooms can reduce viruses in bees and help them live longer. I think I've discovered now that the fungi that are rotting the logs are absolutely critical for the immunological health of the bees. This is a really interesting potential breakthrough in understanding how nature works and how we co-evolve with fungi. Shepard and Stamets plan to expand both experiments by partnering with commercial beekeepers. Eric Olson was the first to sign up. I don't have too much hair left. So I have pulled my hair out. We just can't seem to get a control on the Varroa mite. We've got our fingers crossed. The future of Western honeybee colonies and the billions of dollars of crops they pollinate may depend on it. Well, thank you, EarthFix and PBS. This aired on hundreds of the stations last year. <clears throat> so I have 15 minutes to, to go through the rest of this. So this is, um, this is one, of the fungi, one of the fungi we're using that goes after the mites. And uh, we have a simplicity of a delivery system. We just put the petri dishes directly in the beehive. The bees then uh, spread the, the fungus, and then the fungus infects the mites. So we have this experiment ongoing, and now we have also uh, been doing this indoors as well as outdoors. Um, so that is now mycofactor number four. So, okay, metarhizium, you know, this fungus infects varroa mites. Varroa mites are like dirty syringes. They're injecting all sorts of viruses inside the bees. So at 7%, Infestation of mites, the beehives are considered terminal. 7% and that means the beehives will not survive typically over winter. Then this article came out and, uh, and, the, and it, I was like fascinated. I'm not a chemist, and I, I, but I'm really interested in the decomposition of, of logs by fungi. And this article came out and they found that the bees, uh, uh, the colonies collapse. Some of you may not know this. In two days, they're gone. It's not like there's hundreds of bees uh, at the beehive. They're gone. There's just a few bees. And so they go and they disappear. And when they analyze the hives that have been abandoned, hundreds of pounds of honey, this the group of scientists found, wow, there was no P. chimeric acid inside the honey. Now, I knew what P. chimeric acid was, but I was really surprised to find that P. chimeric acid controls the cytochrome P450 pathway. That is your detoxification pathway. All animals use it. It's how we break down things in our liver, toxins. And without P. chimeric acid, the bees could not detoxify neonicotinoids, glyphosates, you know, herbicides, etc. And so I went, wow. Well, P. chimeric acid, I've seen that. I looked into the literature, and sure enough, as mycelium breaks down wood, it produces P. chimeric acid. So it dawned on me, oh my gosh. So I'm laying in bed and I have this waking uh, dreams and I like to stay in bed and just before all my neurons start firing and, and just think about the milieu of, of ideas and I had this epiphany. I go, oh my God, I know, I think I know how to save the bees. And so I then, so p acid comes from mycelium, it's in these droplets. 
It activates a detoxification pathway. Deforestation and the lack of decomposing wood eliminates uh, the p-cumeric acid, which is also in some cereal grains, but primarily it's in wood as fungi breaks down wood. So it turns out that glyphosates uh, suppress p54 enzymes in the gut microbiome and causes disease of bees. So you want an argument against GMOs? This is it. Glyphosates interfere with the microbiome of animals. <laughs> Okay, so the mycelium is coming up to the surface because of moisture. It's exposed to light. Light then stops the mycelium from breaking down wood and triggers it in the mushroom formation. So when you have blue light in particular, it causes primordia to form. And we know that blue light causes the, uh, produces the precursor for Tamiflu. So I'm going, oh my gosh, this is starting to be really interesting. That was Michael factor number five. <laughs> P-cumeric acid activates detoxification pathways. So we started making myco honey and feeding it to the bees. This is a form of honey that there's no honey involved. It's just mycelium grown on rice. And so we make this really delicious syrup and the bees love it. And then we did these experiments at Washington State University, as you saw, and we fed the bees the extracts uh, in sugar water, all beekeepers practically uh, use 50% sugar, 50% water to supplement and feed their bees, especially commercial growers. So we did this, we fed them the extracts, I just need to speed this up, and an example of, um, of, of a commercial bee uh, operation where the sugar water is being fed to the bees. And so we just introduced the extracts into the bees. And so the conclusion of screening about 20 different uh, polypore mushrooms, very interesting, the red belted polypore, chaga, a birch polypore, amadou, which my hat is made of, and the red reishi gave us extraordinarily interesting results. Now, Dr. T. Shepard, as an entomologist at 39 years spent studying bees, I'm unaware of any materials that extend the life of worker bees more than this. This is, the, this is the time the bees are foraging the most. And what's happened now is bees typically live for about 30 days, nine days foraging. And when you see bees on a flower, it's the last few days of their life. That nine day foraging period has been cut to four days in the past five to 10 years. So the bees are prematurely dying the nurse bees abandon the brood, not caring, taking care of the babies. They become worker bees. They fly away. It's a slippery slope downhill. So the fact that we nearly doubled the longevity of bees, high significance here with the amadou mushroom, is extraordinary. So we've increased the ability of the bees to forage, and we increase longevity with the extracts. Then when the, the red belt of polypore, which the bears introduced, we found at the right concentration, it also had a doubling effect on the longevity of bees. And then with the bee viruses, with chaga, which if you notice in the BioShield Biodefense Program, reduced flu viruses, it also, on a dose-dependent basis, the controls, the viruses go up, and uh, the increased concentration, the viruses go down in the, in the bees. And then with the red reishi, also in the BioShield pro program, reduces flu viruses, H3N2, H1N1, H5N7. Uh, and, and, uh, um, it also, uh, the controls go up. On a dose-dependent basis, the viruses go down. So we increase the longevity of bees by doubling them, and we're reducing their viruses by more than 90%. So we thought. So here is a summary of our initial first year of research. Tremendous increase in viruses, tremendous decrease in viruses when given these four different species. Okay, so the deformed wing virus has been identified now as the number one virus that's harming bees. It is a pandemic that has spread from Asia all over the world. There are no, uh, doctor, you'll, uh, I'll come to this. So in 2016, five peer-reviewed articles identified honey losses being primarily caused by the deformed wing virus. Now there's the Lake Sinai virus, the Israeli apiary virus, um, and um, the, the, uh, the uh, black cell queen virus. These are also viruses that harm bees. But the deformed wing virus is the primary virus of concern being injected by the varroa mites into the bees. So here is an extraordinary statement. 
is that 100% of honeybee colonies in the world are now infected. There is a global pandemic. The bees, they wander and they go to other hives. And so now all wild bees are infected with a deformed wing virus that have come from commercial honeybee operations. And so Dr. Jay Evans, who's the renowned virologist at USDA, I talked to him about two weeks ago, and he said that he had a researcher from England that came over to try to get a virus-free strain of bees. And he said, Paul, I haven't seen a virus-free strain, a free strain of bees in over 10 years. So the, the native bees are being decimated right now. They're, they're going extinct faster than we can determine. I talked to one entomologist. I go, how do you know if they're extinct? And he goes, Paul, if you haven't found them in 10 years, does that mean that they're extinct? You know, it's like a rhetorical question. And so this is a huge, huge problem. And um, so here is our latest results, folks. <laughs> we hit it out of the park. Amadou and Reishi against the deformed wing virus now with a new preparation reduces the virus more than a thousand to one in a week to two weeks against the lake sinai virus this is outdoors this is with queens these are and uh, we've now more than 10,001 of the lake sinai virus so we have been able to potentize this and now we're doing one drop per thousand drops of water this stuff is so incredibly potent so and then against the black queen cell virus, all queens now, unfortunately, have this virus as hurting the queen stocks that, you know, are distributed to, to beekeepers. Also against the black queen cell virus, we're seeing with reishi and chaga, uh, more than a five to hundred to one reduction in these viruses. <clears throat> so I'm very thankful and happy that I did receive a patent on this October 14th. Yes. And they now... <laughs> And my true intention, my true intention is if I can afford it, I want to open source this technology for everybody in the world. So, I mean, think of this. They use the biggest search engines available in Chinese, Japanese, Russian, English, Spanish, you know, all languages. And I got the report back and it said no prior art Except, Paul, your article in Harris Smith Magazine, you mentioned the bees going to your garden giant patch. And at first, you know, I have to say, at first my ego went, whoa, you know. And then I got, really? We all grew up with Winnie the Pooh. We all knew that bees were attracted to rotted logs, and I'm the first one to discover that bees are attracted to mycelium because of the immunological benefit. I gave a talk in front of a bee conference with 900 bee scientists. And I milked it. I said, stand up now if you've ever heard of this. Where did you see it? Where was it published? Dead silence. So the international patents have been issued. <laughs> I call it, I have to name something after myself. This, the, the Stemetsian mushroom bee hypothesis. And it has a synergistic effect in being a help, helping the bees. And that is mycofactor number six. Yes. I have... Three, three minutes left, so, okay, this is, this is crazy. We go back to peak humeric acid. I get a hold of the NIH virology. I said, you sampled over 2,000 uh, samples. I got 77 strains of agaricon. We had three that were active. I want to test 77. They wrote me, wrote me back immediately, said, we not funded by the BioShield program. We won't do bio-guided fractionation for you. You have to send in a pure structure. We'd be happy to work with you, but the structure you sent in a pure molecule has to be juried that no one ever discovered it before. And cytologically, does a virologist think it will make sense? So I'm going, oh, they will test more, but I need a molecule. I don't have millions of dollars. I can't do bioguided fractionation like I did with Scott Franzblau and the University of Mississippi. What am I going to do? And I remembered peak humeric acid. So then, rather than bioguided fractionation, Louis, Louis Pasteur has a great quote, chance favors the prepared mind. So I did the best of all time taking methods, I guessed. <laughs> I submitted 20 molecules, 10 of them, highly active, more potent than antiviral drug controls, all surrounding p cumeric acid, which comes from wood, from the mycelium breaking it down. Five of these molecules are highly active against HPV, 
And I'm sorry to tell you this, but most of you under the age of 30, 90% of you are carrying an oncovirus called the human papillomavirus, which is a ticking time bomb that causes cervical cancer in women and other types, of, uh, other types of cancer as well. There is no good antiviral medicine against HPV. Five molecules that I discovered, highly active against HPV. I did it in five minutes by guessing. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so, <laughs> not, not on my birthday, <laughs> but so again, flu viruses, herpes, norovirus, hepatitis, pox, and also we have polio, and so that is mycofactor number seven. So I want to just introduce to you, there is a mycofactorial equation that I have designed here. Uh, there are the different factors in my life that have been strung together. And, uh, and now we know we can limit disease transmission by insects to plants. Think of that. I, can, I think we have the gateway now of mitigating all viral vectors that harm plants. Using by confusing and controlling the diseases in the insects prior to transmission. So what's next? What's next in this mycofactorial equation? I leave that to you. Many of you, these ideas will synergize, and you might have epiphanies, you know, happening all over the audience right now. So we are be mushroomed. I believe that scientists across disciplines need to work together. Mycodiversity is our biosecurity, and I want to mention that mushrooms, trees, bears, birds, and the bees, we all have evolved to be within the matrix of mycelium. And think of this, for 10,000 years ago, we started agriculture. What did we do? We deforested. That began to demand and dismantle the immunological networks of nature. I think I found something fundamental to the foundation of nature, that the mycelial networks control the diseases of the inhabitants that exist within those ecosystems. This is truly paradigm shifting. That goes way beyond human health and bees. And bees are the second most well studied animal in the world. So I can't believe that I discovered this. I'm not really a beekeeper. I'm a mycologist, you know? Um, and for me to discover this, when all these other great scientists have been working so hard for, for literally hundreds of years cumulatively, is truly amazing. So I want to end with just a two minute, I'm going to be two minutes over, three minutes over, a two minute short movie Louis Schwarzberg and I are putting together. And I want to just suggest to you, let's celebrate decomposition. <laughs> let's let it rot. Mycodiversity is biosecurity, and Bill, with your, with your tolerance here, here's a, a two-minute movie, but I have constructed something new called the Mycoverse. It's my multi-generational platform for helping people for hundreds of years into the future. Yes. So stay tuned on the Mycoverse, yes. because dark matter, the neurons, the mycelium, we all conform and share the same archetype of networking. And so this should be the movie. Mushroom mycelium represents rebirth, rejuvenation, regeneration. Fungi generate soil that gives life. The task that we face today is to understand the language of nature. My mission is to discover the language of nature of the fungal networks that communicate with the ecosystem. And I believe nature is intelligent. The fact that we lack the language skills to communicate with nature does not impugn the concept that nature is intelligent. It speaks to our inadequacy for communication. If we don't get our act together and come in commonality and understanding with the organisms that sustain us today, not only will we destroy those organisms, but we will destroy ourselves.
We need to have a paradigm shift in our consciousness. What will it take to achieve that? If I die trying, and but I'm inadequate to the task to make a course change in the evolution of life on this planet, okay, I tried. The fact is, I tried. How many people are not trying? If you knew that every breath you took could save hundreds of lives into the future, had you walked down this path of knowledge, wouldn't you run down that path of knowledge as fast as you could? I believe nature is a force of good. Good is not only a concept, it is a spirit. And so hopefully the spirit of goodness will survive. Thank you very much, folks.